Hello, welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club's Health and Medicine Forum. I'm Mark Zitter, chair of the Zetima Project, a member of the club's board of governors and your moderator for today. Presently, the Commonwealth Club has suspended all of its in-person programming for obvious reasons, but we are hosting a series of virtual events, including this one. You can learn all about them, some of them are COVID related, some are not, at our website, www.commonwealthclub.org. We're very grateful to the support of our members and donors and hope that you'll support our wonderful nonprofit organization, the Commonwealth Club, by making a donation. You can do so online or you can text donate to 415-329-4231. We'll put that phone number up several times during the course of this program for your convenience. And we also encourage you to like, subscribe, and share videos like this one with your families and friends. During our program, we'll have some time for your questions. Please put them in the chat box, the comment section, and I'll try to get to as many of them as possible. I'd also like to thank Patty James for helping coordinate today's program. And now it's time for me to introduce today's special guest, Dr. David Kessler, author of the new book, Fast Carbs, Slow Carbs, The Simple Truth About Food, Weight, and Disease. Dr. Kessler served as commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration from 1990 to 1997 under both President George H.W. Bush and President Bill Clinton. During his tenure, he helped design the nutrition facts label that appear on all packaged foods. After leaving the agency, he served as the dean of the medical schools at both Yale and the University of California, San Francisco. In 2009, he published The End of Overeating, a book that investigated how processed food companies design products that have powerful effects on the brain that lead people to crave and consume them uncontrollably. He's a pediatrician by background and has published several recent New York Times op-eds on COVID-19. He also was named recently to Joe Biden's Public Health Advisory Committee. And today we'll talk both about diet and the pandemic. So welcome, Dr. David Kessler. Nice to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. Let me start with this. Uh, uh, as you mentioned in your book, more than two thirds of Americans are either overweight or obese, and only an astonishingly low 12% of us are fully metabolically healthy. Those are stunning statistics and sound like a crisis worthy of writing a book about. But of course, there are many other diet books on the market, including one that you wrote yourself. So what do you hope that readers will take away from this book that's different? So, you know, the, the question, uh, it's a fascinating question, the way you phrased it. Um, uh, you think it's a diet book? It certainly talks about diet and health, obviously. So most of the time, the reason I, I, I just uh, smiled when, when you said that, um, most diet books focus on weight. Mm -hmm. um, and the goal was to answer a very important question. Um, and really was the role of diet and metabolic health and the health consequences. Now, weight is key. Right? I mean, weight is central as much as I would like to say you could be uh, healthy at any weight. Um, the fact is when you age, um, it sort of catches up and it has consequences. But I was very interested um, in understanding that that statistic that you uh, cited, uh, why are 87, 88% of us, why don't we meet you know, basic guidelines for not only weight, uh, but blood pressure, blood lipids, blood glucose, um, and why are our bodies in essence in metabolic chaos? And what's driving that? And what's the relationship um, of the foods we're consuming uh, to uh, those diseases and the consequences of those diseases. So this was a follow-up to your previous book. And something that struck me most about your book was for years, we've been hearing that a calorie is a calorie is a calorie. And if you want to lose or maintain weight, then what you need to do is watch the number of calories you eat. But a, a central theme of your book is that you claim that what we eat is as important or almost as important as how much we eat and the two types of carbs is your prime example. So, so I guess this leads us to the title of your book, What Are Fast Carbs Versus Slow Carbs? So fast carbs uh, include both sugars that you know, many people have written about and, and talked about, but it's also starches. 
it's sugars and starches uh, that end up uh, being rapidly absorbed in our gastrointestinal tract. Um, and for many people who are, you know, have struggled with their weight or metabolically vulnerable, that though at rapid uh, ingestion, that almost that that endless flood, that streaming of this rapidly digestible uh, glucose, because all that sugar uh, and starch uh, gets uh, made into uh, rapidly absorbable glucose, what's the consequence of that? That really was the central question. And those are fast carbs. So yeah. it's, uh, it's all sugars, but it's also all starches that are rapidly absorbable. Now, slow carbs uh, are those uh, carbohydrates, uh, those fibers um, that do not get rapidly absorbed in our GI tract. They don't get absorbed in the upper GI tract, and they make it down to the lower parts where the bacteria are and also can stimulate other hormone satiety signals. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, vegetables, legumes, um, those are slow carbs. Well, the most striking thing I took away from the book was about not only how quickly they're absorbed, but how much of them is absorbed. So my understanding from your book was that the fast carbs get absorbed very quickly and pretty much completely, whereas the slow carbs you mentioned, about half of those calories, we actually never, they, they actually never come into our body, so they don't turn into weight in the same way. Exactly. You know, we don't know all the mechanisms um, by which these fast carbs uh, have the consequences they do. We, we know that uh, for, the, uh, for many people, um, they can have you know, severe consequences, both pre-diabetes, uh, diabetes, uh, they go on cardiovascular uh, complications. So we don't know all the science uh, behind the effects of these fast carbs, but we know that you know, they affect, I mean, they're in essence pre-digested. Yeah. Right? Uh, so we eat them, our eating rate uh, is quicker with them. Uh, they go down, go down in a whoosh. Uh, they get all absorbed, all those calories. There's effect uh, certainly on insulin. They don't get down lower in the GI tract, so they don't stimulate uh, satiety hormones. So there are a lot of different mechanisms right, by which uh, they act. And we never, you know, when we, over the last hundred years, as we've you know, created one of these great food processing behemoths, uh, you know, in the United States, um, we never really asked the consequences. What, you know, what are the effects of processing, of taking the structure uh, out of much of the food, um, and with the end result that these fast carbs get so rapidly absorbed? What's the effect of this flood of glucose on our bodies? Yeah. And uh, your book made me think about, you know, one of the reasons we eat is because it tastes good. We like it. Certainly another one is that we're hungry. Uh, and these are related, but not the same thing. And uh, I hadn't realized how the different types of carbs differentially affect our feelings of hunger and satiety. Can, can you say a little more about that? So fast carbs get absorbed uh, in the upper uh, GI uh, tract, as you stated. Uh, they virtually all get absorbed. They get absorbed uh, very uh, quickly. Uh, we know that uh, they trigger blood glucose elevations, uh, blood insulin. Uh, we know that those uh, hormones have effect on our brains. Um, we know that that catches us uh, in these vicious uh, cycles. But one of the things that fast carbs don't do is they don't get down to the lower GI tract. And it's the lower GI tract also is where hormones get re uh, released and they can create signals of satiety, of fullness. So, I mean, is it the fact that these fast carbs are not getting um, down to the lower part of the GI tract, not having these satiety signals? Um, that's certainly one of the mechanisms that I think is in play that catch us in this, these endless cycles uh, of overeating. So we can eat these fast carbs, but still feel just as hungry as before we ate them. In many ways, uh, in many ways. absolutely. Yeah. Look, yeah. you know the the um, the fact is um, that much of these fast carbs are are also delivery vehicles. I, you know, the, the, this starch. I mean, the, we eat about a thousand uh, calories 
of these fast carbs a day on, on average. You know, starch itself, if you go back to kindergarten, you'll remember, you know, starch is this paste. It's, it's this bland, you know, you, you wouldn't want to eat it. But now when you realize that starch is a carrier for fat, sugar, and salt, um, th th that fat, sugar, and salt in that carrier also triggers um, and makes uh, food um, super palatable. And I believe you said that starch actually is, is, is in the majority of these fast carbs, right? Well, the, 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 that's exactly correct. We certainly, we focused a lot, you know, over the last decade, a, a lot of good work uh, on sugar. Um, but the fact is that it's not just sugar. Uh, it's sugar and starch. Um, and, uh, you know, while there's no doubt that the American diet contains a lot of sucrose, um, the vast majority of these processed foods, the central component um, is starch. So it's starch and sugar. Now, I'm sure that uh, part of the reason you focused on this topic is you're a, a doctor, you're a scientist, you're a former FDA head, but you've also been public about some of your own struggles with weight and diet. So tell us how those things informed or motivated you to write this book. You know, so, I mean, I've had, I have suits in every size. I have uh, gained and, and lost uh, weight uh, repeatedly, you know, but the hard part is to be able uh, to keep it off. Um, mm. That's the, the real struggle. And when you study, when you look at these studies, mm. um, you find that almost any diet, people can lose weight uh, in the short term. Um, but it's around six months where weight starts uh, creeping uh, back up. Uh, and the fact is that in many of those studies where weight comes back uh, after six months, you see that it's the introduction. People go back to what they used to be eating, and much of that is fast carbs. Uh, so the diet works in the short term, but this notion that a diet, you lose the weight, and then you don't have to be on it, that's just not the way the thermodynamics work. Yeah. You have to be on it, I mean, for a lifetime. As soon as you let up, um, and especially um, for people who, um, you know, struggle with their weight, who are metabolically uh, vulnerable, who have uh, pre-diabetes, uh, once you start reintroducing uh, these processed carbs, it's almost impossible to keep the weight off. Mm -hmm. So do you have any tips or things that have been successful for you in that regard? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I find, you know, for me um, that... Um, almost any processed carb, um, you know, leads to more processed carbs, lead to more processed carbs, um, and, you know, and, and I want to be careful, Mark, you know, I mean, this is, you know, we're um, still uh, a lot of stress out there, um, people, um, a lot of anxiety, uh, people uh, want uh, comfort, um, and the fact is these highly processed foods, um, you know, they taste, you know, great. I mean, you, you eat them, um, that starch is loaded with, uh, fat and sugar, fat, sugar, and salt. Um, and you eat it and you're in this momentary bliss. And I don't want to take away that, that comfort. There's also, you know, the, the question of what you can get hold of, what's in the house, uh, what you can afford, um, but I think if you look from uh, a health point of view, uh, certainly, you know, my goal is once when this is over, when we can uh, both come out of our houses and once, um, you know, down the road, we, there's a semblance of normality uh, whenever that is. I think we want to emerge. Uh, it would be nice to emerge healthier. Um, and um, I don't know any diet um, that really is successful um, that contains processed carbs. So, you know, there's a lot of confusion out there. What's the best uh, diet? Mm -hmm. um, there is paleo. Um, there is low fat. There is Mediterranean. There mm -hmm. is keto. Uh, when you know, when you really look uh, carefully, um, all of them uh, recommend taking out these fast carbs. 
Okay, so that's something they do have in common. So that's good. Let's get very tactical for a second. Which carbs should we eat more and less of? And as you answer, I want you to comment on two terms that I learned something from in your book about, uh, a little more about complex carbohydrates and whole wheat. Right. Both are very confusing and can be misleading uh, terms. You know, go back to the 1970s and 1980s and the recommendations of the various government uh, agencies, right? Uh, reduce total fat, reduce saturated fat, reduce simple sugars. But then they said, you know, increase total uh, uh, ingestion of complex carbohydrates. And no one distinguished when they used that term. Right? And people did follow those recommendations. Uh, no one distinguished fast carbs from slow carbs. So I think we should get rid of that term, complex carbohydrates, uh, and realize um, that it's starch and sugar, um, which can um, be rapidly absorbed and have consequences. Mm -hmm. So give us an example of the foods we should definitely eat more of and eat less of. Uh, uh, there's, you know, the, the slow carbs um, have, I mean, the key aspect of them is they have their structure is intact. I mean, it looks like food, right? I, I mean, a, a, and that's the key um, because uh, even in those vegetables and legumes, um, I mean, there is some starch in it, but it's relatively uh, modest. But the important part is that, that, I mean, in that whole food, that food has not been processed to the extent it's not undergone the, the, both the temperature, the thermo and mechanical, the, the pummeling of that, that wheat that you know, makes uh, uh, those, uh, uh, that starch, um, uh, those grains uh, so rapidly absorbed. So the key is to stay away from anything um, that, is, uh, that is processed or certainly highly processed. Yeah. It's, it's doing that pre-processing for us. Now, in the in this book, you take to task the food industry for promoting fast carbs that appeal to our taste buds and are cheap to produce, but they're often appallingly bad for our health. So if you now were FDA commissioner, would you recommend regulating those companies differently? And if so, how? No, I, I'm not sure it's regulation that's key. I think the key is information. Um, and be able to tell people uh, what's really in the food. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I have a habit of walking up and down the supermarket aisles um, and picking up a package and looking, um, you know, below that nutrition facts panel, there's that ingredient panel, and mm -hmm. you see what the, the first item is, and it sometimes uh, says wheat or whole wheat, um, and you know, became very interested uh, in really looking into what's in that food, mm -hmm. I mean, what's in that box. Um, it, I mean, is that uh, wheat, I mean, or that whole wheat, really whole wheat? Uh, or in fact, uh, is it been so highly processed? Yes, the, the bran and the germ may be added back, uh, but the starch part is so rapidly processed it's the equivalent of any refined uh, sugar or starch. So you wouldn't do regulation, but maybe some more education. Would you change the uh, nutrition labeling on foods? So I would certainly change the ingredient panel. I think that ingredient panel that lists the, in very fine uh, print, um, which we didn't do when we did the nutrition facts, that top uh, part, mm -hmm. um, uh, I think we have to make that ingredient panel uh, easier uh, to use. You know, when we did the nutrition facts panel, that box that has calories, total fat, uh, sugar, carbohydrates, I think we did a good job with calories, with fat, uh, with sugar. Um, but I don't think we did a good job when we just said total carbohydrates, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, that really doesn't give people a sense uh, that those total carbohydrates can be acting in essence like sugar. Would you recommend perhaps changing the nutrition uh, guidelines, the dietary guidelines? I, um, I think there needs to be considerable thought about that. 
The nutrition yeah. guidelines are written um, for, um, I, I, you know, I, the, the person who is metabolically healthy. Yeah. And I think that the fact is that the vast majority of us don't fall into that ideal person with the physiology um, that they're writing those guidelines for. The mm -hmm. fact is, I mean, uh, the, the majority of us struggle with our weight, uh, with uh, blood lipids, with blood uh, glucose, you know, different uh, various of, uh, part, numbers of us have different um, uh, issues. But the fact is, um, I think we need to be writing guidelines uh, for not only the ideal uh, physiology, but also for those who are most vulnerable. And I think um, allowing these fast carbs to be uh, continue to be consumed in the quantities they're consumed, uh, uh, for those who struggle with their weight, uh, have problems with their blood sugar, um, I think that's a problem. So I think uh, we have to recognize, we have to protect those who are um, most vulnerable. And the fact is, that's most of us. Yeah, at this point. Well, it's always a challenge in, in public health, I, I, I know. To, first of all, for all of us know certain things we should do, and it's a lot easier to know those things than to do them. So there's there's that, that challenge. But along the way, for diet in particular, it seems like we've seen so much conflicting advice over time, it's hard for people to keep track. What have you found? What has been the most successful public health campaigns about diet that have really gotten people to, to, to understand something new in a way that's beneficial to them? Yeah, I think that's a key question. I think that, you know, the nutrition community, in some way, um, we've added to the confusion mm -hmm. uh, because uh, you, there are so many diets. Everybody has their parochial interest. And that's in part why I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to simplify, um, you know, simplify recommendations um, and cut through uh, the noise. And that's why you know, I, I came down to, to three things um, that I think most people can agree on. One is to limit the amount of these fast carbs. And mm -hmm. I think almost every nutritionist would agree uh, with that. Two, we haven't discussed it, but to lower our LDL or our blood uh, lipids, to try to get that as low as possible. Because I think there's a potential to wipe out atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, and the third is for everyone to engage in moderate intensity exercise. Yeah, you know, I think rather than uh, talking about all the different, uh, you know, all the differences and all the nuances and the fights between scientists, I think we have an obligation um, to play it straight uh, and say, look, um, these are the things we can agree on. And that's why I did the book. Great. Thanks. We've got a few audience questions I want to uh, address or have you address. Uh, one is about, um, these are related sort of artificial sweeteners and related in terms of diet drinks, diet sodas. I know for a while people thought diet sodas are better because there's fewer calories, you don't have real sugar, but then there's some evidence that actually people gain as much weight with diet sodas and so forth. So what about the health of these artificial sweeteners at all? And then also is it better to have diet drinks than, than non-diet drinks? Yeah. You know, I, it, that's a question that we've been asking for the last three, four decades. Mm -hmm. um, and there's not a clear answer um, uh, to that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, certainly in, in the case of uh, the individual who's going to drink a, um, a 200 calorie uh, soda versus a zero calorie soda, um, uh, the answer is zero is better than 200. Mm -hmm. um, uh, compared uh, to water and, and other beverages that don't have these uh, sweeteners, uh, if you can uh, do that, that's obviously uh, better. Um, but there's still not a clear answer, a scientific answer that I can point to data um, that show that diet drinks um, are uh, the driver uh, of increased uh, appetite. The, the, you know, the problem is that people who drink diet sodas, I mean, also uh, drank sodas. Uh, they also um, like sweeteners. 
Um, so that um, a lot of that um, research is sort of confounded. I don't think it's the diet soda as much as getting the brain conditioned to like sweeteners because once you do that, once you use food for the reward pathways, you're sort of stuck. That's a problem, yeah. Um, one question we got too is how does wine and alcohol fit into the whole fast carb, slow carbs equation? Yeah, I mean, that, that's also a great question. Um, uh, and um, I can answer that uh, uh, from the reward pathways uh, yeah. as much as from the metabolic pathways. Um, uh, because uh, whether it's alcohol or whether um, uh, it's uh, uh, sweetened uh, beverages um, or it's hyperpalatable foods, um, they all uh, work on the same reward pathways. Um, and they all give us this momentary uh, bliss. Um, they all can trigger um, an emotional uh, reaction when we get cued. Um, so they work on the same, uh, pathways. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the metabolic, you know, the metabolic issues, I mean, are less, um, are less important than the fact that they all really focus on that reward pathway. Mm -hmm. We've got a question about something that's been in the news a lot lately, and even the medical journals, intermittent fasting. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, certainly, if you intermittent fast, you're going to um, reduce the number of calories. Uh, the question is, how long can you uh, do it? Um, you certainly will um, quiet down the metabolic pathways. Uh, you're not flooding your bodies for um, periods of time. Um, whether um, it, er it offers any super advantage uh, over just cutting out uh, fast carbs um, uh, over the long term. I haven't seen any data to suggest that there's any super properties of intermittent fasting. But obviously, if you fast, less uh, fast carbs, uh, less metabolic chaos. And that's important, um, but it's not clear um, that there's any real super benefits. Okay. Okay. We had another question too about um, whole wheat bread. Is it okay to eat them in moderation? So look, I mean, I'm not going to, in moderation, anything is, uh, is sort of fine, but just recognize that much of the whole wheat out there is not whole wheat. That's I, I mean, I mean it, it, it is processed uh, and it's been highly processed um, and that label has to change. Uh, we have to have much stricter requirements uh, because for many uh, products, consuming that whole wheat, um, yes, you're getting some brand, you're getting some germ added back. There may be some benefit on that from that fiber. Uh, but the other big component of that whole wheat, that endosperm, that's highly refined right? and it's problematic. So we shouldn't assume that whole wheat means healthy, right? That's correct. All the way to. Uh, Question about gut bacteria and how, to what degree does that impact the way people respond to a diet or calories? Uh, an emerging feel, field, um, you know, if you can get food down into your lower GI tract uh, and let some of the bacteria do the processing rather than the food manufacturer do the processing, I think we're much uh, uh, better off. There's still a lot of science that we uh, don't know. Um, but I'm all in favor uh, of you know, the slow carbs and letting them interact uh, with the microbiome. Uh, uh, I think that's much better uh, than the processed stuff um, that gets rapidly absorbed higher up in the GI tract. Okay. We had a question about what if somebody is on SNAP, meaning you know, they have lower income and they've got fewer choices, what are the healthiest fast carbs that they can get if they, if they need to, to use them? You know, uh, I think there's been a lot of work uh, with SNAP um, being able to encourage and create incentives and uh, allow some of those SNAP dollars um, to buy more uh, healthy foods. Mm -hmm. um, and I know people have been working uh, on that. Um, you know, I, I think that it, the goal is if it doesn't look like food, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would stay away. 
um, uh, I, I think th that structure, that natural structure, uh, because once you alter that natural structure of the food uh, and you destroy the integrity of that food, that's going to be rapidly absorbed and that's problematic. Mm -hmm. um, so, so look with the snap dollars, if it looks like food, um, uh, that's where I, um, I would spend those resources. Great. Well, there's a question about, uh, I just heard a, a little piece of trivia that the only natural food that doesn't spoil is honey. I'm not sure if that's true. I heard that. But the, que the, que the question for you is, what's your opinion about honey as a food? Yeah. You know, there, um, it, it, it's sort of, um, there are um, certainly uh, cultures where honey is a um, large part of the diet um, uh, uh, in uh, uh, certain um, areas where uh, the, 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 but you see in those, in those communities, uh, there's more, more primitive um, uh, uh, and a lot more fruits, a lot more vegetables, no processing, uh, you know, and a lot more physical activity. I mean, mm -hmm. to me, I mean, if you're a marathon runner, um, if you're uh, in that hunter gatherer mode, if you're expending a lot of energy, uh, is honey going to be fine? Sure, because you're going to burn it all um, uh, before uh, you're going to store it. So I don't think it is uh, problematic. The, the real problem is about honey and the, uh, these fast carbs uh, in an environment of plenty, of overabundance, of excess uh, calories, uh, of positive energy balance. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's where uh, you run into to problems. Mm -hmm. I understand. Well, um, because of your expertise and your role on Joe Biden's Public Health Advisory Committee, I know that our listeners want to hear your thoughts about the pandemic. So let's let's turn to that. Uh, almost exactly two months ago, it was March 13th, you published an op-ed in the New York Times saying that, I'm going to get this quote, there is, this is March 13th, you're saying there is no reason the testing infrastructure can't be up and running in seven days so that every person in America who needs a test can be tested. The president should demand it, unquote. Now, that infrastructure still isn't in place, obviously. Why not? You know, I think that if you look at the numbers today, um, the, the numbers have gotten better, right? I mean, there are a total of eight, nine million uh, tests totally, about 250,000 uh, a day, um, but certainly not enough by anyone's uh, standards. Uh, it was a question of taking responsibility mm -hmm. uh, and um, accountability uh, and um, also, uh, I think, uh, of competence. Uh, I think the administration chose uh, to leave it to others um, and uh, didn't take primary responsibility uh, for getting up in place uh, the systems necessary uh, to do what the president said, which was for every American who wants a test, they can get a test. I mean, regrettably, that's not been uh, the case. I think we're going to eventually get there. It's still going to take time, but we have lost um, very precious time. Look, the fact is that for every day, mm -hmm. for every week, right, that we um, let people, people were uh, out there um, conducting business as usual, going around when that virus had a jump on us. Uh, every day uh, in March uh, cost us and cost us dearly. And we didn't have the testing when we needed the testing. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. And now we're up to, you said, 250 or 270,000. One, one Harvard paper said that we need to get up to 20 million. And the Trump administration says, there's no way that's going to happen. Do you believe we need to get up to as high as 20 million? And, and where do you think we can reasonably get to in the near, the near term? You know, there's a new antigen test out. Um, I think that will uh, add millions more availability, certainly um, uh, each week. Um, so we will see the numbers uh, go up uh, significantly. Look, the problem is we have to identify the asymptomatic carriers. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, if I'm t take somebody who's 65 in their house and they're wondering, can I go out again? Will it be safe? Right. I mean, that's the question people are, are, are asking. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, I mean, the, the answer is, you know, you could go out is, I mean, if you, you have to know what the, how much virus there is in your community. Mm -hmm. I mean, the people you're interacting with, I mean, are they positive? And the problem is they may be positive and they don't have symptoms. And that's the only way you're going to be able to know whether the people you're interacting with are positive mm -hmm. is if they're tested. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, let's, I think we could all agree the more testing that we do, the safer we can be. Um, and we lost mightily because we weren't able to realize that for weeks and weeks, this virus was spreading exponentially and we didn't even see it. Yeah. Because yeah. of a lack of testing. Right. Now, you wrote another piece in the New York Times last month that our collective behavior will be the primary determinant of whether we can keep this virus in check. So I want to ask you, what are the key behaviors? And then do you think we actually will follow them? I am concerned. Um, I, I am very concerned um, when I see um, the key tools that we have available to combat this virus now in the absence of a vaccine, of, in the absence of monoclonal uh, antibodies, in the absence of a prophylactic uh, drug uh, therapy. Um, the, all we have, I mean, really are masks and social distancing and the ability to reduce our, our contacts. Um, look, I mean, this is now, this has reached the White House. With all its testing, they're still having positive cases. I mean, that shows you the, the degree that this virus is still out there. It's transmitting. It's transmitting today. Um, you know, there's some 20,000 confirmed new cases in the country. You know, you, you, that, those are the confirmed cases. You know, and if you just think about how many are out there that have not been confirmed, use some multiple, 5, 10, 20. There's still an enormous amount of virus out there. Um, and I think that the tools that we have are masks, social mm -hmm. distancing, um, trying to reduce the effect of contacts between people so the virus can transmit. And, and I see it um, increasingly becoming a political issue. The yeah. mask issue, uh, uh, the and, and I don't get that. Mm -hmm. I, mean, we're, I mean, we hold each other's fate in our hands. How I act, right? If when I go out, I mean, affects you and it affects my neighbor. Um, and I don't think this is about. You know, I don't think we should think about this in terms of laws and regulations and these are things I. And mandated to do. I mean, this to me is one of the great um, moral questions. I mean, how can we act as individuals, as citizens? How do we protect each other? And and I would hope that everybody can understand um, that that's what's uh, at stake. Yeah, yeah. Well, clearly, we're seeing a tension between public health uh, and civil liberties. And uh, unfortunately, often that seems to be breaking down by political party. But I will say the people who are more concerned about reopening the economy and civil liberties will say that, hey, California was the first state to issue these statewide shelter in place orders and feels very proud of that and kept most of its hospitals from getting overwhelmed. But our, our new case rate's been pretty stable for the last five or six weeks. And, and, you know, public health people said we have to do that to make it drop. Why hasn't it dropped? It hasn't dropped because there's still transmission. Yeah. I mean, we plateaued uh, as uh, a country, but we're still hovering. Um, you know, the R, the reproductive level, is still still across the country, pretty close uh, to one. And there's not a lot of uh, room uh, for error. Uh, I mean, for error here. Look, we're at twenty. Figure in New York City is what, 20% immunity, 
population immune serological tests aren't perfect. Um, but let, let's, let's take that number. You know, most scientists recognize that we're not going to be able to slow down uh, this virus until um, that herd immunity number gets to 60, 70 percent. Mm -hmm. So this virus, whether we like it or not, is going to run its course. Just because we have, you know, many of us have stayed uh, home and had the privilege of staying home. Others have had to be out there. They've come back home. This virus is still very, the, the, the transmissibility is very high. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not gone uh, by any means. And I just don't understand. You phrase this as a choice between public health and civil liberties. Um, I mean, ask anyone who cares about their civil liberties, you know, what's the civil liberties uh, of that, you know, 80 year old in a nursing home, uh, that uh, meat packer, per, uh, that person who works uh, in that meat packing uh, plant, um, that prisoner, that prison guard, uh, everyone in those tight uh, circumstances, you know, this is about how we're going to take care of each other. I, 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 I don't understand why we can't come together uh, as a country uh, and say, look, of course we have to uh, open up, um, but let's do it uh, as safe as we can. Let's have, for those of us who can continue to work at home, let that happen. For those um, who have to uh, get the economy going, um, let that happen, but let's provide them uh, with the tools they need to do it safely. I don't, I don't think it's that hard to come together. And I just, I don't get the dynamic that's at play mm -hmm. uh, of why we're fighting with each other uh, and why there's not a unified approach to deal with this virus. Yeah, but clearly there is to some degree. Um, but, 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 but understand the consequences of that. Yeah, yeah. Right? We are about 4% of the world's population. 25% mm -hmm. right? plus of the deaths uh, and cases. Like COVID. Right? Right? I mean, how do you think the rest of the world's looking at us right now? Mm -hmm. We can't get our act together? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean the, the consequences of this are, are enormous. I mean, how, how we act, how we deal with this virus, how successful we are, I mean, is going to be with us for not only six months or a year, but for years to come. I mean, you know, America was always the place, American leadership, was always a place that w was able to certainly lead, coordinate on the vaccine side, on the drug side, um, uh, the, 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 the entire global public health community. And I think in some ways we're abrogating that responsibility. Um, and if we don't get these numbers down, if we don't get off this plateau, right, uh, and keep us off this plateau, we have another wave like this. We have a wave that's greater. We have multiple waves. Mm -hmm. right? We're not going to be sitting here uh, and having the, the luxury of having these debates uh, of, uh, you know, I don't want to wear a mask. I want to wear a mask. Yeah. I mean, we, we got to keep each other safe. Well, yeah. Yes. Uh, and and you mentioned that New York has perhaps 20, 25% immunity. Are, are you, uh, do you, do you feel pretty strongly that those who've had the virus have been infected are immune afterwards? You know, immune for how long? What do we mean by immunity? Um, there's no reason to doubt. I mean, the general assumption that is held for almost every other, you know, uh, virus is that the presence of neutralizing antibodies mm -hmm. uh, do confer some benefit. Now, how long? They confer that benefit, how strong that benefit, that remains uh, to be seen. But there's no reason to assume um, that that immunity won't be there, at least to some extent. Still more questions to be answered. So we're hopeful that you can't catch COVID a second time, at least not very soon afterwards. 
Look, I mean, it's, 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 key, that's a key, look, it's a key question, right? Uh, not only for whether you can catch yeah. the second time. That's not what the, I mean, that, that's certainly going through my head. The real question is, is a vaccine going to be effective? Mm-hmm. I mean, because you have to make antibodies, but you got to make the right antibodies. We've seen in certain cases, we've seen back in the 70s with RSV, we've seen with dengue fever more recently, that sometimes you make antibodies um, to a vaccine and you can have, you can make the infection even worse in certain mm-hmm. populations, mm-hmm. right? I mean, so the, the basics of a vaccine, we got to be able to hope that neutralizing antibodies or certainly a cell response and immune response along with those antibodies are, are the immune factories in our bodies. If a vaccine is going to work, we got to make sure, I mean, those antibodies and those immune cells have to work. Right, right. Um, one more question on, on this uh, on this area is, is there seems to be a lot of different estimates of the percentage of Americans who have been infected, as well as what the death rate is from those infections. Uh, so a lot of controversies, even two orders of magnitude difference. Right. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, so I can tell you, if you look at the New York numbers, I tried to calculate it yesterday. I got to a uh, infection fatality rate of about 0.8 to 0.9. There's a health affairs article um, that came out about a week ago that had the case, uh, the infection fatality rate of 1.3. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, there's a meta-analysis where it comes out to 0.75. Take all those numbers uh, together um, and you know, assume it's 0.7, 0.8%. We will get better uh, data. That is compared to flu, which is 0.1. Um, there's no doubt um, that the lethality uh, of COVID is several multiple fold greater than flu. Also, just back of the envelope, if uh, we went for herd immunity and that took 75% of the population to get there, and we have a roughly 1%, 0.8% mortality rate, you're talking about maybe a million Americans who die. That's an awful lot of people. So herd it's, immunity. It, 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 it is yeah. all... Um, I mean, this is all a race yeah. Right? yeah, between keeping people safe until that time when we can get either convalescent plasma, monoclonal antibodies to give people um, uh, the uh, antibodies they need to prevent or, or to treat or a vaccine. Look, we just, have to, we just have to keep these big waves from reoccurring. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's slow that down until we can get better therapies. You know, what's key here, and there's progress. I mean, we're taking, I mean, I, I see a way to take the lethality out of this virus. You saw positive re- results with remdesivir. That's mm-hmm. for the viral phase. There's an uh, inflammatory phase, you know, a second phase where people crash um, mm-hmm. and get this uh, ARDS uh, pattern. There are anti-inflammatory drugs for which there's clinical uh, effect. We're going to be able to put together uh, different combination therapies that will reduce the fatality. And by reducing the fatality associated with this, we can at least manage uh, this disease without the threat uh, of the death rate uh, being what you suggest. Great. Well, David, as important as this issue is, people on the uh, who are watching want to get back to talk about carbs. So I have another couple of questions for you about that. And one is about the relationship between carbs and glycemic indices. I know you talked about this in the book. Is it the same thing? Yeah. So the, the, the glycemic index is um, one measure uh, of carbohydrate uh, rise uh, in uh, blood uh, glucose. Uh, and you can think about it that way. Um, the problem is glycemic index for a number of reasons is not a perfect test. So I think that certainly fast carbs uh, do correlate uh, with higher um, glycemic index. The problem is sometimes you can have foods that are uh, low glycemic index. And for certain aberrations, there are also fast uh, carbs. There are some other research measures how quickly the the starch is absorbed. Um, But there's certainly, uh, it's one metric that can be used. 
What's the best way, here's another question, to overhaul a diet to get rid of the fast carbs? Um, cut out processed foods. It's pretty, pretty simple overall there too. Uh, and here's a question that, that sort of bridges the two topics. So it's not quite about carbs and it's about vitamin D that most people who die from COVID, according to this uh, audience member, have been found to be low in vitamin D. So if that's the case, would supplements reduce the risk of getting sick or, or, or ill from COVID? Yeah. I haven't seen uh, that data and I need um, to look at that data and, and uh, will. Uh, but I just, without seeing that data, um, I can't comment. Okay. How do plant-based diets relate to your recommendations regarding carbs? So um, plant-based uh, diets, um, again, can be uh, good, but I mean, you know, uh, plants produce a lot of starch. Um, uh, that's a fast uh, carb. So the real question uh, is what kind of plant-based uh, diet um, uh, I think is, is key. Um, so again, w one can't just generalize and say all plant-based diets, uh, heavy starch, uh, rapidly absorbed, um, just because it's plant-based uh, is not going to uh, uh, get you uh, to where you, you want. I think that whole plant diets, uh, you know, non-processed uh, yeah. foods, plant diets. And I think that's probably the intent uh, of the questioner. No, no doubt that if one's looking for the optimal diet, certainly both to reduce fast carbs um, as well as to reduce LDL. And we haven't spent any time doing that. Uh, Plant-based diets can be very effective uh, in doing it. Um, you can get a reduction of as much as 40% in your LDL, which we know is causative, with atherosclerotic heart disease by a plant-based diet, at least many people. It's not going to be as powerful as some of the drugs out there, um, but certainly uh, a major advantage in lowering your LDL. Yeah, I know. So it's interesting. Uh, what, your second major recommendation about reducing LDL said, you know, do it via a plant-based diet or medication. And talk about the differences or why you would want both of those. So no doubt that if we can get... LDL down in this country. You know, we now know that LDL is, L, the number of LDL particles, let me be exact for the scientists who are listening, the number of LDL particles um, is causal, certainly on the causal chain, right? And if we can reduce on a popula population-wide basis, everyone's LDL significantly, we can wipe out 70 to 80% of cardiovascular, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. We can have as big effect on our health as we had on tobacco if we can reduce uh, that LDL. Uh, and the easiest way uh, to do that uh, is with a plant-based uh, diet. Now, drugs, you can get there, and in some ways you can get there faster and you can reduce your LDL uh, stronger. But I didn't want to... Uh, just focus on uh, drugs. I mean, I think that would be a mistake. Um, I think diet is a big part of that. You know, I asked the great cardiologist, Gene Bronwald, you know, if drugs work so effectively, do you just say, well, let's forget about diet? Um, and he said, no. I mean, it is the first uh, thing that we should all uh, focus on. Because medicines do have um, some side effects. Um, they are not uh, the perfect uh, answer. And if you can get your LDL down, and we all do that, we can wipe out much of heart disease in our, certainly atherosclerotic heart disease in our lifetime. Terrific. Well, I have a specific question about the humble potato. Are potatoes fast or slow carbs? And they aren't processed, but aren't they full of sugar? Should we eat more potatoes? Yeah. Um, so the, the fact is that when you cook that potato, you gelatinize that potato. Uh, and it becomes a fast uh, carb. Um, I mean, can you uh, have um, the structure of the potato maintained um, so it's less rapidly absorbed? Sure, so certain boiled potatoes uh, do not uh, have the same effect, but the vast majority of these potatoes are processed and they are, you know, it's just, it's like eating any other sugar. No, so you wouldn't prescribe French fries. 
Th that's uh, yeah. that's clear. And difference between white potatoes versus sweet potatoes or yams? So a great question, right? Um, different kinds of starch. Certain starches are resistant starches um, in the in the sweet potatoes uh, and others, so they don't get as rapidly absorbed. It's a good question. Great. So tactically, someone asks, what are five plants that we should eat? Five plants. Five plants. Um, that well, you know, the the question is also what five five grains um, uh, we should eat, um, and there are certain grains um, uh, such as uh, uh, buckwheat, uh, pumpernickel, um, uh, certain kinds of flowers that are more resistant uh, starches. Um, the the answer is any plant uh, whose structure is intact. Right or essentially intact and has not uh, been uh, pulverized and not subjected uh, to the thermomechanical forces of that food processing. So any plant whose structure is intact. That's probably how we make them. Okay. And then here's the reverse type of question. What are the very worst processed foods? Um, anything that takes um, that wheat kernel, uh, subjects it, uh, to intense heat, intense shear forces, um, uh, and makes it into uh, something that um, uh, it doesn't look like food. Mm -hmm. um, so it's anything that has been subject to that intense heat and those intense shear forces, that's going to destroy um, the starch molecules, uh, increase the surface area, increase the rate of, by which we digest them. And if I'm not a scientist and I want to understand how much things have been pulverized or processed, is there a way I can tell that from the label on the, on the package? Fair point. No. Um, you can look in the box and mm -hmm. say, does it look like anything like food that anything that's grown? Um, so you can have a sense uh, if it's not growing in that form, in that field, uh, uh, if you haven't seen it in nature uh, like that, um, it's going to be have been... Uh, subjected to pretty intense heat, uh, pretty intense shear forces. And someone asked a question, you see, you've mentioned if food is intact, what, what does really intact mean in this context? So uh, what you want um, is um, the food just not to, um, uh, the, the membranes, uh, the, the structure, the way uh, the starch molecule is even packed together. Once you destroy that, by intense heat, by intense shear forces, you're gonna increase the surface area uh, and you're gonna increase the ability of our enzymes you know, in our digestive system to quickly absorb those molecules. So, I mean, it's, it's a question of literally pummeling that food, which is what food processing does. Yeah, yeah. I remember I, when I was a kid, I used to love orange juice. I thought it was so healthy for me. And I later learned that just drinking the orange juice by itself was a very high percentage of sugar, whereas eating the orange is much healthier. You have the structure, you have the fiber. I mean, yeah. sure, you have some of the juice um, that um, is still there and it's there's still uh, some sugar, but you have a greater chance uh, because of that structure, that food, because of that fiber, uh, of much of that orange making it into the lower part of your GI tract, and it's not going to be as rapidly absorbed. And do you worry, it, can someone eat, can one eat too much fruit? Sure. I mean, but I mean, you know, in terms of getting too much sugar from fruit, yeah. if you're just eating regular fruit? Yeah, look, I mean, you asked me the question about, I mean, could I, you know, in moderation uh, uh, earlier? Um, absolutely. Um, I, I think the fruit has, there's no doubt that, that um, uh, as long as that structure is intact, are, are there uh, sugars in that fruit? Yes, um, but that doesn't concern me uh, as much as uh, when that fruit uh, has been processed uh, and it all has been transformed into a fast car. Gotcha. Okay. Well, we are just getting to the end of our time, and we spent uh, the majority of it on, on carbs, but I did want to get you a chance, since you didn't uh, say everything you may have wanted to say on the pandemic, uh, for one last question. And the question is this. What's the one piece of advice you would give the Trump administration about managing the pandemic at this point? Um, 
let the scientists uh, go out front um, and uh, let the politicians um, uh, recede uh, into the background. Uh, we're only going to get through this um, if we trust uh, our public officials, because they, again, we talked earlier, um, this is not going to be, we're not going to get through this because of laws or regulations. We're going to get uh, through this uh, because we have the, the moral sense of we each are going to do what's right. And if people can galvanize um, that collective sense and we all feel that we're being played straight just give us the facts. Uh, the American people can handle uh, the facts. We will get through this. It's the mixed messages. It's the spin. It's the promises uh, that will never be uh, fulfilled. Um, that just is making this, as hard as this is, um, it's making this even more difficult. Okay, well, thank you for that. I want to give a big thank you to Dr. David Kessler, the author of the new book, Fast Carbs, Slow Carbs. We encourage you to order your copy today through your local independent store or, or at barnesandnoble.com. I also want to thank all of the visitors and viewers viewing us online. I want to remind you the club has a wide range of virtual programming, both COVID and non-COVID relating. Not that many more things on carbs, but, but, uh, but some good content nonetheless. And if you enjoyed today's program, please consider supporting our, our organization, the, the oldest and largest public affairs forum in the country. You can donate online at www.commonwealthclub.org. At this point, I'll just say I am Mark Zitter. Uh, now this meeting of the virtual Commonwealth Club is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>